Good afternoon and welcome to today's Euromed Migration Talk. Today we are accompanied by Paul Butcher and Alberto Horst Neidhart from the European Policy Center in Brussels. Paul is a policy analyst in the European Politics and Institutions Program. Hi, Paul. And uh, Alberto is a policy analyst in the European Diversity and Migration Program. Alberto, I would like to start this interview with a question for you. Um, if we look at the migration narrative, especially in the past few years, since the 2015-2016 migration crisis in Europe and the Mediterranean, uh, we can see that the narrative in the region has been strongly polarized. Do you think the COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced this polarization or tamed it? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so the short answer is that, uh, of course, COVID-19 has certainly had multiple effects on the political debate as well on the narrative about migration. Uh, migration is no longer a high priority in the political agenda as uh, governments must tackle, first of all, the health, uh, economic and uh, social impact of the pandemic as a matter of urgency. Uh, at the same time, we also know that migration is uh, no longer one of the most salient uh, issues of concern to the European public. Uh, governments are, uh, in other words, expected to deliver and devote themselves to COVID-19 instead. So I think, uh, seen under this slide, uh, they actually, actually the pandemic may offer opportunity, opportunities to normalize the discourse, the discourse after years of polarization. We could also optimistically hope uh, that the key contribution uh, to the fight against the pandemic made by people on the move uh, will uh, sort of shift the discourse in favor of more sustainable uh, policies and less control-oriented uh, policy, policies in this area. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, similar dynamics, so uh, similar dynamics to what you described a moment ago will not happen again uh, in the near future. Uh, from our research, we know that uh, fringe groups uh, are already trying to exploit the damage done by the pandemic to polarize the debate and to mobilize uh, the public against migrants, also by spreading disinformation. So um, in fact, there is, uh, I would say, a concrete danger uh, that quote unquote, uh, immigrants will be used as a scapegoat for rising unemployment, for example, or for the slow ec economic recovery that will follow the pandemic. Very good. Now, Paul, moving on to you, uh, you and Alberto are coordinating, organizing uh, a project on disinformation about migration in the European Union, promoting alternative uh, narratives. Now, in our field, in communicating migration, uh, often the terms uh, disinformation, misinformation, strategic manipulation and fake news are misused or confused among each other. Uh, this happens both in the, in, the, in the mainstream media, but it also happens sometimes with uh, expert journalists. Now, uh, can you help us define each of these terms? Thanks, Marco. Um, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of confusion um, about the terminology here. Um, and it's made worse by the fact that it's not always easy to say what exactly disinformation is or what is disinformation and what is not. Even for experts, that can be difficult at times. Now, from my perspective, the big distinction to be made is about intent. So strictly speaking, disinformation is information which is false um, and is deliberately spread with the intention to mislead people. Uh, whereas, on the other hand, misinformation isn't necessarily intentionally misleading. Um, so misinformation could be material which is incorrect, but the error is just a genuine mistake or maybe motivated by ignorance. Um, for example, during the COVID-19 period recently, we've seen a lot of people who are sharing rumors or giving bad advice, and it's not because they are trying to mislead people, it's just because they're genuinely misinformed or they're trying to make sense of a confusing situation um, and they are contributing to this complicated information environment, but they're not actively trying to deceive people. Um, 
the disinformation isn't necessarily outright false. In fact, in the research that we've been doing, we've found that most hostile narratives tend to use manipulated or out of context information. So for that reason, I think that focusing on the intention is more useful than trying to make a distinction between true and false when there's a big gray area in between. And that's where the manipulation comes in. As for this term, fake news, um, many academics and researchers suggest that uh, you should avoid using the term fake news at all, mainly because it's been politicized. Uh, basically, think about how Donald Trump refers to people when he says, you're fake news. You know, that means that uh, the, the term itself has become kind of hijacked by political actors. And anyway, fake news as such is only a part of the problem. A lot of disinformation doesn't necessarily pretend to be news. It doesn't present itself as news articles. It can be all kinds of other things like messages on WhatsApp, for example. Um, so it's not necessarily fake. It's not necessarily news. Uh, disinformation is a more kind of useful overall topic for researchers. Um, but that said, a lot of the public still recognize the term fake news. I think it still has a purpose, uh, particularly for communicators to use it when they are trying to reach people um, to explain exactly what it is they mean, because disinformation is a bit of a confusing academic term sometimes. You defined different terms, different phenomena, different types of action. How do you cope with uh, each of these phenomena? I mean, uh, how do you cope with disinformation? How do you cope with misinformation? Certainly, there must be different approaches to, to adopt when, uh, when, uh, when tackling this phenomena. What, what is your take on that? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, the main importance of making this distinction between misinformation and disinformation for me is that there are different motives in spreading it and therefore there are different strategies to counteract it. Um, so people who have been genuinely misinformed or have made a mistake, they can be reached through sympathetic messaging uh, with fact checking, for example. But fact checking isn't likely to make much of a difference for the radicals who have uh, who are deliberately spreading disinformation. As for those who are spreading real malicious disinformation, they're not going to change their minds. They're probably spreading it for political purposes anyway, or to try and convince others. So communicators shouldn't waste resources trying to reach those people. Instead, try to contain them and stop their message from reaching undecided people. Very good. Now, I would like to move to Alberto because of something he said earlier. So we discussed the polarization of the narrative. And as I said before, I mean, the two of you are leading a project on disinformation about migration in the European Union. So that seems to be quite a hot topic at the moment. Alberto, do you think that uh, maybe due to its polarized nature, uh, the migration narrative is particularly vulnerable to, to disinformation compared to other narratives? What are your take, what is your take on that? Yeah, this is, uh, this is an important question, of course. Um, migration, I would say, is uh, itself, in itself, as vulnerable to disinformation narratives as any other topic which is of high political interest uh, and any other topic which is widely discussed in traditional media as well as on the internet. Of course, migration has been one of the most uh, salient concerns of the European public since 2015. And so the combination between high salience, I would say, and the polarization of the migration debate can explain why it has attracted so much attention uh, and also has been subject to a lot of disinformation. Now, from our research, we know that there are other factors that make migration a somewhat unique case and a topic of uh, or subject to a lot of disinformation. Now, um, for example, migration can be connected to a variety of other issues which are of general political interest. Uh, let me just mention the economy and the future of the welfare state, uh, questions relating to identity and culture, uh, issues concerning security. So also for these, in my view, we see uh, 
a lot of disinformation about migration. Another problem uh, which is specific, I think, with disinformation about migration is that uh, people on the move cannot really protect themselves or against it. And for this reason, perhaps also we have seen that uh, to a large extent it's being used by xenophobic groups and sometimes even by governments to channel uh, discontent about the economy or to channel insecurities about cultural and demographic changes against minority groups uh, and against refugees in particular. Uh, but the reality is uh, that this information not only affects migrant groups, uh, it also uh, harms the uh, interest of society more in general. It uh, can further divisions, uh, it can erode uh, social cohesion, it can also undermine trust in public institutions. So um, I would say that uh, this information about migration is perhaps a unique case, but we have to be mindful of the fact that uh, the widespread disinformation about migration is not only damaging to migrant groups, but really to society at large. Paul, then let's stay with you on this. Uh, what kind of disinformation strategies on migration are you currently mapping within your project? And what are the main challenges involved in addressing them? Mm. Um, so our research is looking at um, disinformation articles that have received high levels of engagement on social media, which is the main way that disinformation is being spread, although not the only one. Um, and we focus on four countries across Europe, which are Italy, Spain, Germany, and the Czech Republic. So we have a variety of different circumstances, countries with quite different politics and also quite different attitudes and uh, attitudes towards and experiences with migration. Um, and we have found so far that most disinformation narratives in the field of migration portray migrants as a threat um, and attempt to exploit readers' fears. Now, those can be fears relating to um, losing health um, or losing wealth or losing identity or culture. So, for example, they might portray migrants as violent criminals um, or as an infection risk during the coronavirus period um, or as a drain on the community's resources. Uh, or they might speak about an elite conspiracy to replace Christian Europeans with Muslim migrants. Um, so all of these um, narratives are basically portraying migrants as a threat and trying to exploit the quite often quite, um, um, quite genuine concerns and worries that European um, individuals might have. We feel that the best way to fight against this kind of disinformation is by constructing alternative narratives that don't seek to counter every disinformation story because there's too much to try and um, counteract every single one. Instead, we should try to reframe the debate um, while taking seriously the genuine fears and worries that disinformation actors are exploiting. So that means we need to demonstrate to Europeans that uh, policymakers and politicians are working on solutions that will ease their worries. And their worries about access to health care or to jobs and basically to show them that politicians are working on this and that blaming migrants won't help. And uh, when it comes to uh, fighting disinformation, is there any specific worth mentioning initiative that comes to your mind when, uh, when we talk about setting the bar very high? Mm. I think there's a lot of creative thinking going on in this at the moment. Um, now, the best way to fight disinformation, in my view, is through person-to-person -person contact, especially if that can take place in person rather than online. Now, obviously, that's a bit harder to do just now in these times of social distancing. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we have seen this explosion of um, disinformation and misinformation during the COVID-19 period. Because um, these narratives particularly thrive when people are socially isolated, when they are restricted to only getting information from a few sources, um, and when they feel cut off from those around them. So I think those initiatives that try to restore this social contact, I think they're very promising. Um, and a couple of examples that I can think of, there is the Stop Rumours campaign, uh, which is taking place in a few uh, local areas in Spain. Um, and this is great because it has a local focus. Uh, it has in-person meetings. 
Um, and also it's called stop rumors, right? It's not called stop fake news. It's not called stop disinformation. Um, everyone knows what a rumor is and it gets away from this politicized, polarizing, controversial accusation about fake news, um, which might cause a defensive reaction. Um, and also the European Commission is currently working on a similar idea, which will involve reaching out to people via their friends and family. Um, and I think that's brilliant. Every communicator knows that there are people who you can reach and people who you can't. And this idea will help to reach those who you can't reach through the people you can. Excellent. To conclude, I would like to ask Albert to some proper advice. Um, what would be your recommendations for practitioners working in the field of migration to address this information and bring the debate back to the middle? Do you think that is possible today? Uh, it is, first of all, uh, necessary to shift the discourse away from the divisive narrative and polarizing rhetoric which has dominated the debate in the last few years and construct a new narrative, uh, a, a narrative that shows that migrants and resident populations have a future together. Um, and I would say that uh, COVID-19 creates opportunities in this respect. Um, so we know, uh, and the public is well informed, that foreign-born doctors, nurses, and caretakers were really at the forefront of the fight against the pandemic. We also know that foreign essential workers uh, ensured that we could get over this difficult period together. So progressive communication actors who can uh, reach out to the wider public could use and should use these positive stories that resonate with the public uh, to undermine the us versus them discourse that paves the way for, for disinformation in this area. And at the same time, try to construct a hope-based narrative uh, promoting also evidently evidence-based uh, discussions about the topic. So in other words, uh, to address this information, uh, I think practitioners, public institutions, as well as uh, civil society, we should not forget, must uh, once again preempt this information by working on their communication strategies and, and try to reach out to the wider public, uh, as mentioned uh, by Paul before, through trusted uh, intermediaries. Uh, and once again, to be success, successful, it is important that uh, practitioners and public institutions do not only do the talking, but that they also listen to the concerns and insecurities of people and factor these in, in their responses to this information. And uh, particularly in the aftermath of COVID-19, many citizens and residents will be legitimately concerned about increased inequality or about job prospects. And inevitably also disinformation actors and radical groups will try to exploit or to prey on these fears. And so for this reason, it's important uh, in my view to demonstrate with hard evidence that insecurities linked to migration are driven by, often driven by distorted and manipulative information. However, when and where citizens' concerns are well-founded, showing empathy, like Paul mentioned before, and understanding can also contribute to restrict the ability of uh, disinformation and disinformation actors to exploit these fears. So only if we have these comprehensive response to, to this information, we can successfully address its root causes and also promote a healthier political debate about it. So really, uh, these are recommendations that concern a variety of actors, not only communications practitioners, but we need to have a comprehensive response, which is made of different kinds of initiatives from the grassroots initiatives at local level that Paul mentioned before, to also the involvement of uh, bigger uh, institutional actors, such as the European Commissions, which also has a role to play in this in this uh, field. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be in touch soon and we hope to work together again in the future. Thank you.